Uh, my name is Tom. I'm an independent developer and recently I've been working with Roly leading development of the Lumi app. And today I'm going to be talking about how we develop that using Juice and React Native and Unity. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Lumi app is uh, and then why we chose this particular set of technologies to build it. Um, then the main chunk is going to be about how we actually integrated the technologies together. Um, and then some of the best practices we kind of picked up as we went and a bit of reflection on how it worked out for us. So for anyone who doesn't know Roly, um, their kind of breakthrough product was the Seaboard, which is one of the most well-known MPE controllers. Uh, they followed this up with Blocks, which is like a modular portable music making system. And their most recent product is Lumi, which was announced on Kickstarter a few months ago. Um, and there's two parts to Lumi. So as you can see here, the main hardware part is a keyboard. Uh, it's a 24 key keyboard. It's wireless, so you can connect it over USB-C. And the kind of USP is that the keys light up in brilliant color and you can control what color all those keys are. So there's professional applications to this, you know, like uh, showing scales, showing arpeggios. Um, you can snap two keyboards together to get more keys. It integrates with a blocks ecosystem and so on. But the second part of Lumi, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, is the Lumi app. And this is a kind of more consumer focused thing, and it aims to take advantage of the light up nature of the Lumi keyboard to make learning and playing music more enjoyable. Um, so, in the app, a user can go into the catalog of songs, which is a mixture of classical and contemporary songs, uh, load up a song, and then the core part of it is really this kind of 3D gamified experience for learning to play. And you can see the keyboards lighting up in sync, and we've got things like you get a score and you get streaks, and it's meant to be a good, fun way of learning. And eventually, users will be able to progress beyond this to like learning towards sheet music. Um, the other part of the app is we have like interactive video lessons, and you can see here again, you know, the keyboard's lighting up in response, and we have various features here, like you can sometimes it'll pause and wait for you to play bits and so on. So building an app like this had some uh, had some quite interesting requirements from a development point of view. So first of all, we wanted it to be cross-platform, and for us, that was primarily meant iOS and Android uh, phones and tablets to reach the widest market possible. Um, we wanted the core kind of 3D game bit that I just showed you to have visuals and an experience which is really compelling and was kind of at the same level as games that people like to play. We wanted it to be a really fun thing to play with. We wanted the navigation of the app so when users are looking at the content, choosing what song to play, we wanted that to feel slick. And I'm calling it feeling native, like all the animations, transitions, scrolling and stuff should feel right. It should feel how, you, how it does when users use Netflix or another app like that. Obviously, we wanted the app to integrate the Lumi hardware. That's quite important. Um, we also wanted to have a good audio engine, so like Roly are known for audio stuff. We wanted it to sound good. We wanted to be able to do things like uh, time stretch the audio. Um, we also wanted to be able to reuse existing code we had at Roly for things like synthesis and sequencing and so on. And finally, but quite importantly, we wanted the ability to iterate quickly with a fairly small development team. Um, the time frame for a project was quite short, and because it's a new area for Roly, we were to some extent designing as we were developing. So we needed the ability to try out ideas really quickly, and this was quite important for us. So some technologies that, that we looked at, um, first of all, Juice. So for anyone who doesn't know, Juice is a C++ application framework. It's owned by Roly. It's cross-platform. You can target all the major desktop and mobile platforms. Um, it's primarily designed for audio applications and plugins. It's really widely used in that world, and it's great for working with audio. Uh, you can also build other applications with it, and it's got its own UI toolkit, so you can build a UI as well as the audio part. So looking at our requirements, Juice is cross-platform. It does all the platforms we care about. In terms of building like these game quality experience, um, Juice isn't really going to help us that much there. I mean, you can do OpenGL in Juice, but you're going to be writing a lot of stuff manually to build a game there. In terms of getting this kind of native feeling navigation, again, Juice has its own UI toolkit, but because it's cross-platform, it renders the same on every platform, but it's never going to feel exactly like the platform it's going to be on. So like scrolling and stuff isn't going to feel like it does on iOS or Android. Uh, in terms of integrating with the Lumi hardware, uh, yeah, so actually the Lumi hardware uses the same kind of system as the blocks do, which uh, it, it has its own scripting language called Littlefoot, which runs on the hardware. And Juice has got an integration into that, so we can load Littlefoot scripts onto the hardware and interact with it from Juice. In terms of building a high quality audio engine, I mean, yes, like I said, this is kind of where Juice specializes. Um, and all the existing audio code at Roly is using Juice, so we could reuse that code. <coughs> in terms of this ability to kind of iterate quickly on the product, uh, Juice 
doesn't really do that for us. I mean, Juice makes working with C++ a lot more enjoyable, I've found. But C++ is still quite a slow environment to iterate in. You know, you've got compile times. It's not ideally suited to doing UI work, that kind of thing. So it didn't quite tick that box for us. Uh, another option is native development. So that would be like Objective-C or Swift on iOS and Java on Android. And obviously, each platform has got its own set of APIs and UI widgets that you can use to build an app. So that's not cross-platform. We'd have to write a lot of the code twice. You might be able to write some shared stuff in C++, but you'd be writing a lot of code once in, once in Java and once in Objective-C. In terms of getting this game quality experience, kind of yes and no. Like You probably can get a bit more than you would with Juice in terms of libraries that are out there to help you do this and stuff that's in the OS. But it's still going to be fairly hard work. In terms of having this nice navigation, this kind of native feel, um, yeah, this is native development. So you're using the platform components. It's going to scroll correctly. It's going to, you know, it's going to feel like a native app. Um, integrating with Illumi hardware, there's nothing on the native platform to do that. You know, we could write something ourselves, but it would be quite a lot of work. Um, and again, on the audio engine, you, know, you can obviously build a good audio engine on each platform, but it would be a lot of work, and we'd be writing it twice. And in terms of this ability to iterate quickly, um, no, I mean, our team didn't have much experience in native development to start with. Um, also, you're writing a lot of stuff twice, and you still have to compile it. So really, for us, this wasn't a great option. Uh, another option we kind of considered was web services. You know, I hope everyone knows what web is, but building it with HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Um, and there's technologies like Web Audio and Web MIDI and WebGL, which you can use to make kind of more interesting multimedia applications. So obviously, the web is cross-platform. In terms of making this kind of game experience, um, you know, there's stuff out there which will help you do it, but again, it's not ideal for it. You know, you're not, it's not going to be super easy. Navigation, it's not going to be native, but you can make a nice navigation experience on the web, and people are very used to interacting with web type things. Integration with Lumi hardware, so as I mentioned, there's Web MIDI, and a main sticking point is that Web MIDI is not available on Safari on iOS. So for us, this kind of killed that option because we, obviously iOS is a huge market and it wouldn't be able to communicate with the Lumi keys. Um, and again, in terms of the audio engine, like web audio is progressing and you can do a lot more in it, particularly with things like audio <laughs> worklet and so on. But again, like mobile browser support of this is not great and mobile is our primary kind of target. Um, but one advantage of web is it's really quick to work, you know, it's really quick to iterate. You're using JavaScript, um, it's, there's a lot of off-the-shelf stuff you can use and doing like nice UI transitions and stuff is really easy. So another option is React Native. And if anyone's not aware what React Native is, it's a mobile application development framework created by Facebook. Um, the key selling point is really that you can write applications that feel and actually are native, but you write it using JavaScript and you write it using web technologies or things which are very similar to web technologies. Um, and one of the advantages is it's got a really good UI development experience. Like You can use the CSS that you know if you're a web developer from web development. Um, you can do really nice animations easily. It's got this great feature called hot reloading where you can change your code on your computer in debug mode and the device will update instantly you know, without reloading or anything. So you can very quickly iterate on the UI there. Um, and it's cross-platform. It targets iOS and Android sort of officially. Um, I, spoke in a workshop a couple of days ago. We talked about how you can actually reach desktop as well with React Native, but it's not an officially supported target. So React Native is cross-platform. It did the platforms we care about. It's not an environment for building a game in. Like, we did experiments in this, and it's just not the right way to do it. It's more concerned with building a sort of traditional UI. In terms of a navigation, yeah, so React Native, even though you're writing it in JavaScript, the end result is that you use the native platform components. So it's going to use like whatever the platform implementations are. So your scrolling and your interactions and so on, they're going to feel just like a native app. There's nothing in React Native to do with MIDI, so we can't integrate with Lumi hardware. And there's nothing to do with audio, so it's no good for our audio engine. Um, React Native is great for iterating quickly. Um, we would kind of worked with it a bit before, and we know that you can, things like this hot reloading, for example, you can really quickly iterate on UI concepts. Um, so it's great for that. And then one final technology is Unity. So Unity is a game engine and a game development environment. It's fairly industry standard. They say it's used in about 50% of mobile games. And in Unity, you write your game code in C Sharp, and then there's a, in, an IDE, the Unity IDE, where you kind of do the 3D elements and laying out your scene and what have you. And it's cross-platform. You can actually target pretty much anywhere you might want to run a game, which is impressive. That list just goes on and on. So Unity is cross-platform. For building a game, it's ideal. Like It has all the stuff you'd want, like collision detection and nice shaders, and you can easily like pull in, pull in effects, visual effects, and so on. So it's great for building a game. For building the rest of the navigation of the app, uh, it's not ideal. A little bit like Juice, it implements its own UI widgets, and they're not going to feel 
like, like a native app. So it's not ideal for that. Um, there's nothing in there to integrate with Lumi. We could write our own integration. It'd be quite a lot of work. Um, Unity has an audio engine, but it's designed for games. And it, you know, we want to do more stuff like sequencing and having like an audio graph of plugins and so on. So Unity is not really ideal for that. Um, Unity is great for iterating quickly on a game. Um, C Sharp is pretty easy language to write in. It has like a similar concept to Hot Reloading as React Native. So if you know Unity, you can move pretty quickly there. So discounting native, because it's not cross-platform, we just didn't have the resources to support that, and web, because you couldn't communicate with hardware. Um, if we look at Juice and React Native and Unity, you can see none of them do everything we wanted. But between them all, we have a green tick on each one. So we sort of started thinking, is there a way we can combine these technologies to get the advantages of all of them in building this application? Um, at this point, excuse me, it's kind of helpful to look at the components which make up the Lumi app at a high level. So we've got the audio engine, and this is what's going to be connecting to the Lumi Keys hardware and doing stuff like synthesizing notes when you play a key, um, playing back the audio, time stretching it, playing back MIDI, and communicating with Lumi Keys to tell the keys to change color and so on. Then we have this game part where you know, we've got these 3D visuals being rendered. Um, we want to do things like scoring. Uh, we also want to play back the video for the lessons in there so we can seamlessly intersperse it with 3D content. And then we've got a user interface, and this is how users navigate the app and users find content in the app, you know, um, the kind of everything which isn't the game, the, the game part of it. And finally, we've got the business logic, which is like, I guess this is, in my mind, what coordinates the application, and it does stuff like talk to our API to find out what songs a user can see, or like when a user finishes a, a song, we're going to submit their score to the API. So it's all this kind of just a coordination of the application. And if we go through each of these components, they each actually map quite nicely to one of the technologies we just talked about. So Audio Engine, like this is what Juice is great for. And as I said, for games, Unity, excellent. User interfaces, React Native is ideal for this. And in terms of a business logic, um, actually JavaScript's a great language for writing this kind of thing. Like you can get a lot done with not very much code. And if you're working with APIs and stuff, because it's the language of the web, it's very easy to do these kinds of things. So again, the business logic maps quite nicely onto React Native. And if we look at this, we've actually got these, you know, if we join them together, we've got these three areas which map to these three different technologies. Um, and you know, they'd each be ideal for it. But the problem is, each of these technologies tends to be used in isolation. So you're more likely to have like a Juice app, or a Unity game, or a React Native app. And they're not designed to integrate with each other. So the kind of challenge was, could we find a way to combine them and communicate between each, each different <coughs> technology in a way which would make a good developer experience and a good user experience? And the answer is hopefully yes. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about how we integrated Juice and React Native. And this is probably the more like complicated part of it, really. Um, so our aim here is to have a React Native UI. So the user interface is going to be purely in React Native. We're not having any Juice UI. And the audio engine is written in Juice. And the audio engine is headless. You know, the audio engine, we just want it to make sound. We don't want to see anything. So for this to have any meaningful use, the audio engine and the React Native UI are going to need to communicate. So React Native is going to need to send messages to the audio engine saying things like, load this MIDI, load this MP3 that I've downloaded, or start playing the audio in MIDI, you know, and the user presses the start button. And the audio engine is going to want to speak back to the React Native part of the app, for example, telling it that it's loaded some MIDI, and these are the notes that are in it so it can render some representation of it. Um, or you know, the user's reached the end of a song, these kinds of messages going back and forth. So starting at the top, in the like, technical sense, integrating Juice and React Native into one project. So we start with a standard Juice project, which has got all our Audio Engine C++ code in. And after we export that from Producer, which is going to create an Xcode or an Android Studio project, we run a script we've written, which is going to integrate React Native into it. So on iOS, um, we use CocoaPods, which is going to create an Xcode workspace with React Native alongside our audio engine. And on Android, there's like some shared objects and some boilerplate you do. And this gets you React Native in the same project as you do so audio engine. Then, Conceptually, it's still kind of a Juice application at the top level. And what happens is when Juice starts up, it's going to bootstrap React Native and tell React Native to take over a root view. Uh, we do this using a custom app delegate on iOS and a custom activity on Android. Um, I can tell you in more detail later if you're interested. And actually, by doing this and wrestling with the compiler a little bit, you can have these two components running alongside each other. But the problem is they're not communicating, so you're not really getting anything meaningful out of it. 
So it's helpful at this point to understand a little bit about how React Native is architected. I mentioned already that you write your UI in JavaScript. It's actually a dialect of JavaScript called JSX, where you can kind of mix in this like XML type syntax. And you write these components, which are essentially a description of your UI. Um, I've not got time to go into any detail, but there's a link there to a talk I gave a while ago. We're introducing React Native for C++ developers if you're interested. Um, and then the end result, as I mentioned, is actually you're getting the native platform UI components on Apple, UI view, UI label, uh, you know, Android, we've got a view, a text view. So we're going from this sort of abstract representation, this HTML-like syntax, to the actual native components. So how do we get there? Our JavaScript dis dis description of the UI is running in what you can think of as a React Native runtime. So this can take this description of the UI and turn it into actions that need to happen to generate that UI, like create a view, create a text, make its color red. So in React Native, we write the UI declaratively. We say what we want the end result to be, and the runtime works out the steps to get there. And this JavaScript needs to run somewhere. So we have a JavaScript interpreter. And in the case of React Native, this interpreter is JavaScript core, which comes uh, is part of WebKit. So on iOS, we use the bundled version on the platform. Uh, on Android, React Native includes a specific version of it, I guess, for consistency. Um, a thing to note here is that this is just a JavaScript interpreter. It's not a full web browser. There's no HTML or CSS. It's just JavaScript. So we have this JavaScript running. What's, how do we get over to here, though? And the answer is there's a core native part to React Native. And this is written in a mixture of Objective-C and Java and C++. And this core takes advantage of a feature of JavaScript core, which allows you to expose your native code to the JavaScript environment. I think you use a C API to do it. But you can say, here's a function in C++. Give it this name in JavaScript. And you can just call it as a JavaScript function. And you can send messages back. So React Native takes advantage of this to hook up this native core to the JavaScript world. And this allows the React Native runtime to, for example, send a message saying, I want to create this view component with a text component inside it. And the core is going to interpret that, figure out what it needs to do on the platform, and create these native components. And then going the other way, um, if I interact with something, you know, I touch it or whatever, that's going to create a touch event. And the native core is going to pick that up, you know, delegate, what have you. That's going to, again, do some processing. And it's going to send it back to the JavaScript environment. And ultimately, my React app is going to get a message saying, oh, it's touch event occurred. So the interesting thing for us here is that we have this two-way communication between the native and the JavaScript worlds. And this is a lot like what we want to do with our audio engine and our UI. We want to send messages to C++ and send messages back to JavaScript. And fortunately, React Native have actually made this reusable. Um, so we can, we can do this with our own native code. Now, the official React Native way of doing this is something called a native module. I'm not going to go into detail about the code, but I'll quickly run through it. So here, we're communicating from JavaScript to C++. So we want to call a C++ method, or actually an Objective-C method here, um, from JavaScript. And this is the iOS version. This is an Objective-C. There's a corresponding Java version that I'm not going to show you. So at a high level, we use a macro to create a module. This is a React Native concept. And then we can use another macro to export a method so it's available from JavaScript. So here I'm exporting a method called say hello. It's going to take a string name parameter, and it's going to write something to standard out. The cool bit is on the JavaScript side, you just call this like any other JavaScript function, essentially. So React Native gives you this native modules object you can use. And then I can just say, like, native modules .my module say hello, And that's going to call into this native code, and it's going to write hello, Tom, to standard out. <laughs> Um, and then going the other way, so if we want to communicate from the native C++ world to the JavaScript world, we do this by sending events. Um, and again, uh, we have, so we can use this React event emitter base class. And um, this gives us the ability to call send event with name. This lets us send an event which has got a name, which uniquely represents that type of event, and a body, which is some data. So here we're using a dictionary. And then on the, C on the JavaScript side, I can add a listener for events of that type, and I can handle them. So if we get a message with type hello, we're going to console log hello and the name. And then from my application code, I can get hold of an instance of a bridge, for React, uh, sorry, this module that React Native has created, and I can call this method. So this does work. Um, we did actually build an app at Roly using this methodology uh, called Roly Play. But we found, as we built out the application, that there are some downsides to this way of working if you're building something reasonably complicated. So. Primarily, a bigger disadvantage is that the code which is exposing this native module is written in Objective-C or Java. We're not writing it in C++, so we have to worry about these two other languages, and you have to like 
convert stuff in and out of the correct types and so on. It gets a little bit painful. Um, also, this native module is a React Native construct, and it exists outside of our Juice application. So if we want to like access something which is conceptually quite deep in the hierarchy of our app, we have to provide a way for something outside to call into that. So you can't just access a private member, for example. You end up having to come up with like wrapper functions and so on. And in general, this approach just gets quite messy for a larger application. Like It doesn't promote a good architectural pattern. So we invested some time in developing a Juice module, which is called React Native Bridge. And this, this, is, this is intended to make communicating between C++, specifically Juice, and React Native easier. So we have this base class called a React Native Bridge client. And any class that wants to communicate with React Native can implement this class, this base class. And it gets two important methods. So it gets one called registered JS request callback. This allows it to expose a function with a given name to JavaScript and emit event to JS, which lets it send an event back to JavaScript. Um, the key thing to note here is that this integration is all in C++. We don't have to write any Objective-C or Java. And we can define our hooks in, in and out of the JavaScript world in the same class as we're implementing our functionality. So architecturally, it's much cleaner. So I'm going to show you a quick example of what that looks like. So here we're going to call a C++ method from the JavaScript world. So we have a class called transport. Hopefully, you can sort of read it. Um, and this is implementing Juice React Native Bridge Client. And we're initializing it with a name of transport, which I'll show what that means in a second. Then in our constructor, we are registering a JS request callback. You notice it actually says async. This is referring to the fact that the callback will run on a message thread. Um, and we're going to expose something called, we want to call our method set playing. So we've got a string here, set playing. And then the second parameter is a lambda function. And this is what's going to get invoked when we, when we call set playing. So on the JavaScript side, um, we have this React event bridge, which we've written to help you communicate into the C++ world. We've got this method send request. So when I call send request, I'm going to call one of my callbacks that I've registered. And you'll notice that I actually call transport colon colon set playing. So it's automatically namespaced our callback with the name of the class that it's in, which we gave it up there. Um, this helps prevent kind of namespace collisions. And we can pass in some data with our request. So we're passing in a JavaScript object, playing, equal, playing is true. So when we call that, it's going to invoke this Lambda function. And you can see it's actually pulling in, uh, it gets this data object. And from there, we can extract the <coughs> playing field that we've passed in. So we've got this helper to get a Boolean out of there. This is going to give us a Boolean playing of true. And then we can call set playing down here, which if you notice, that's a private method. But because this is defined in the same class as a functionality, we can do that. And then we're going to return nothing because there's no meaningful return value here. We can actually return stuff here. And that will be returned asynchronously as a promise to JavaScript. So this lets us just expose all the bits of a class that we're interested in right in the class itself. And it's a real time saver compared to using the way that I just showed you. And then going the other way, if we want to send events from C++ to JavaScript, so here I'm going to listen for notons and send an event to JavaScript so it can log out a message in the JavaScript console that has been a noton. So I've got my class. Again, it's a Juice React Native Bridge client. And when I get a noton message, I'm going to call emit event to JS, which was the second method I just mentioned. Um, the first parameter is the, the type of the event, so we'll call it note on. Um, the second parameter is the body of the event, so we've got this helper to create a JavaScript object, so dictionary, um, and we're going to pass it the note number and the velocity of the note that we got. And then on the JavaScript side, I can, we've provided an emitter you can use, and you can call add listener to add a listener for a specific event. So, here we're listening for MIDI handler colon colon note on. Again, it's been namespaced to avoid naming collisions. Um, and then this callback will get invoked on the JavaScript side whenever we emit that event. So we'd log out whenever we get a note. So again, communicating the other way becomes much more trivial. It's like one line of code rather than lots of crazy stuff. So this works really well. This makes like exposing functionality to the JavaScript world much, much easier. You know, you almost don't have to think about it. But it's not the entire solution. Um, as your application grows, you pretty much inevitably find there's parts of the application state that you want to share between C++ and JavaScript. Um, and you kind of want to do this ultimately by having two copies of the state. You know, you've got two separate environments, um, and JavaScript wants its own copy of the state. Uh, we found that most commonly, you had some state in C++ which JavaScript wanted to have access to. So for example, uh, you've got a sequencer, it's got some MIDI notes, and you want to render those in JavaScript. Now, what we don't want to be doing is constantly asking, like, what's notes? You know, we don't want to be constantly asking for this data. That's not very efficient. So we want to have two copies of the state. Um, 
Now, for simple cases, you can use emit event to JS to send events describing you know, what's just happened. Um, and that's fine, you can do that. But as your application grows and the state gets more complex, keeping it synchronized by sending events describing what happened is pretty error prone and manual and time consuming. And you know, if you miss an event or you make a typo, then your state goes out of sync and your application has all these weird bugs. So we started thinking, what if we could automatically keep the JavaScript copy of the application state in sync with C++? So as a little aside here, I'm going to introduce a value tree. Um, value tree is a, a juice class. It's a juice data type. And it's commonly used for storing your application state. It has some properties which make it ideal for this. So you can think the value tree is a sort of tree structure. I always think of it as an XML document. And you can serialize a value tree to XML, which makes it good for like loading and saving your files, for example. Um, a value tree can also have change listeners at any level of a tree. So when something changes in, in this data structure, we can get a callback and we can do something in response to that. Um, and it also supports undo redo, which again makes it ideal for your applications, for your sort of central application state. And Juice actually has a way of synchronizing two value trees, and it does this by using change listeners to listen for changes to a value tree, and then sends messages using like a binary format describing what changed. And this is a class called a value tree synchronizer. So I guess you could use this if you had like two instances of an application, you want to keep their state in sync over the network, for example. So we wondered, what if we could do the same, but rather than keeping two value trees in sync, keep our JavaScript state in sync with C++? And this is what the value tree JSON synchronizer does. Um, so the concept here is that we're going to describe the changes that are happening to a value tree, but we're going to do it in a JSON format, JSON being JavaScript object notation, something that JavaScript can understand. Now, as I mentioned, the value tree is this XML kind of tree structure. Um, in the JavaScript world, the kind of usual way of representing state is using objects, and objects are dictionaries. So on the left here, we've got a simple value tree for an audio engine. And on the right, we've got how you probably represent that in the JavaScript world using, using, a, using nested objects. And we can see that they're just fundamentally different representations. So like in a tree, you know, you've got a node type here, audio engine. Whereas in the JavaScript representation, there's no, there's no concept like that. We just have a key of an object called audio engine, which itself contains another object. Uh, then we've got this transport node. So that's, again, a key of transport. And then this, again, has an object inside itself. And this property of playing false just becomes a property on the object. And then we have these three track nodes here. Notice they have no containing element or anything. Um, in JavaScript, you need to <coughs> store those in an array because we care about the order of them. So rather than just having these three nodes, we have an array of tracks. And again, they've been converted into objects. So really, what I wanted to show here is that these two worlds are not the same. And it's not true. It was not like hard and fast rules for how you get from an XML kind of representation to an object representation in a way that the object is natural to work with. We didn't want objects where you had like really weird structures because we wanted writing JavaScript, the JavaScript part of it, to feel as natural as possible. So we came up with a concept of writing a mapping, which describes how the value tree structure, which is it there, is going to map to the JSON structure. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but at a high level, this mapping is saying, like, when you encounter a node of a certain type, what should we do with it to represent it in JavaScript? So if we encounter a node called Audio Engine, we're going to turn that into an object with a key of Audio Engine. Um, and then we're going to go down a level. We're going to describe what children can be inside that node. So if we have a node of transport, we're going to, again, turn that into an object. And you'll notice it automatically converts the uh, <coughs> playing equals false into a property on the object. Um, and slightly different, when we encounter a track node, we've got these three track nodes, we're saying we actually want about each of those to be an object inside an array, and we're calling that array tracks. So you can see when it encounters these tracks, it's turning them into an array of track objects. So this system allows us to describe how a value tree maps to JavaScript, and it's more flexible than I show here. So we've built it so we can take kind of arbitrary value trees and create quite a natural JavaScript representation of them. Then what happens is we use this mapping to send state updates. So in the same way as I said, the value tree synchronizer describes what's changed in the value tree with a binary format. We do that, but using a format called JSON patch. 
Uh, this is a kind of standard for describing changes to a JavaScript object. It's a fairly simple uh, format. So we're saying here, I want to replace the playing property of my transport object, which is inside my audio engine object, a bit like XPath, and we're going to replace that with a value of true. So the thing to note here is that we are describing the changes in the state. We're not sending the entire state every time. So it's quite an efficient and performant way of keeping this JavaScript copy of the state in sync with the C++ world. And then JavaScript, so these updates get sent over the React Native Bridge. We emit events to JS. And it then applies these updates to its own representation of the state. And then the way we've built the application, we use a library called MobX, where you have a concept of like observables and then components which can observe that data. And the end result is that our application UI can automatically react to state changes in C++ and update itself. So you know, if I send this over and playing turns to true, and we have a play icon which switches between play and stop, it will automatically switch to the new state. We don't have to do anything manual here, because everything is reactive from that point on. We, stem, we describe the change, and the UI updates itself. And um, this makes sharing state between C++ and JavaScript really quite trivial. Um, if I'm honest, it's probably a little bit overkill for what we currently do in the Lumi app. But we we've, we've prototyped much more complex functionality and found that this is a real time saver. So to briefly summarize what I just showed you there, um, we've got these two juice, two juice modules, a React Native Bridge and a Value Tree JSON synchronizer. Um, using those, we find that we can have a pretty great experience building applications which have a Juice Audio engine and a React Native UI. They remove a lot of the pain points that we found building it without them. Um, kind of one of the key selling points is that, to a large extent, you're writing code as you would do natively in C++ or in JavaScript. Um, you don't have to. Most of the time, you don't have to be aware that you've got this bridge between you. You know, like we're trying to make the state as natural to work with in JavaScript and. Uh, you know, exposing your C++ functionality is just one line of code. And we are hoping to open source these modules next year. Um, we found that they, they work really well for building this kind of application. So hopefully, we'll find a way to get them out there and people can start playing with them. So <coughs> that's, um, that is how we, sorry, just check on doing the time. What time does it finish? OK, cool. Um, so that's how we integrate Juice and React Native, um, which is really like the core part of the application for us. But we also have this Unity part we want to integrate. So we've got <coughs> essentially a game we've written in Unity, and we want to integrate that into our React Native UI so that we can show and hide the game as appropriate. Um, we want to obviously have our audio engine running as well. So here we actually have communication from the audio engine to the game. So for example, when we load a MIDI file, we want to tell the game what notes have been loaded so that it can render all these blocks in the right positions. Um, and when the user plays a note on the Lumi keys, we're going to send an event to Unity saying this note was played so the game can react accordingly. And we also want to send events the other way so the game is responsible for setting the key color, for example, when we want to highlight a note that's coming up. Um, or maybe when we're doing one of the interactive lessons, it needs to say, like, start playing from this point. We also need to communicate between React Native and the game. So for example, when the user presses the Start button, we want to show the game, and then we want to start it playing. And we also want to communicate from our Unity game to React Native. Like when you reach the end of a game, Unity knows what the score is, and we want to send a message to React Native so it can then show it to the user, send it off to the API, whatever. So I'm going to talk about how we integrate Unity and React Native, because this is really the key part of the puzzle. From Unity, you can export your project, which you've got in the Unity IDE, to an Xcode or an Android Studio project. So this is if you want to build a native app, you can export it, and you get an Xcode project or whatever, and you can build that, run it on your device. This is how you distribute a Unity game. And there's a library that someone's created um, called React Native Unity View. And what this does is it takes this exported version of your project and essentially modifies it so that rather than the Unity game taking over the whole screen, taking over the whole application. It just renders to a React Native component. And we can then, so we actually get this component called Unity View, and we can place that somewhere on our application, and we have our Unity game embedded within React Native, and it can be full screen, or it can be small, you know, it's up to us. Um, so then, with this library, this has modified this export, which is uh, C++ files on iOS and on Android with some Java. Um, we then have to integrate that into the same project. So we end up having our React Native plus our Unity plus our Juice in the same project. Um, this, at a high level, it's just like 
you kind of add it into the Xcode project or whatever. There's actually a lot of compilation fun to get that working properly. But once you've got this, you actually have this ability to embed Unity within your React Native application. And this React Native Unity View library provides a way to communicate between Unity and React Native. So from React Native, I can post messages to Unity. And on the Unity side, I can listen for those messages and respond to them however I want. And from Unity, you can send messages to React Native. And again, React Native can listen for those messages. So we have this two-way communication like what we had for Juice and React Native. Um, and this allows us to send the messages we wanted between the game and React Native. Oh, sorry. Um, now, that's, the, that's basically the Unity and React Native part sorted. It, this library made that much easier than I thought it would be. But we still have this communication we want to happen between the audio engine and Unity, so you know, sending information about notes and so on. So one route you could go here is get a handle to the Unity <coughs> application that's running and interact with that directly from C++. Um, what we actually do at the minute, we kind of cheat and we just send those messages over to React Native and then it passes those messages on to Unity. Uh, if I'm honest, this is just something that we did because it was easiest and thought we'd end up replacing it at some point, but it actually seems to work well enough that we've not had cause to replace it yet. So React Native is kind of acting as a middleman here. Um, that does mean we can take advantage of things like the value tree synchronizer that we've written in React Native without having to re-implement it in Unity. So it's not as crazy as it seems. Um, and actually, at this point, we've got, all the we've got all the components we need existing together, and we have the communication between the components that we need in order to implement implement everything. So I'm just going to show you what the project structure looks like just to help you visualize you know, what's actually in the project which we compile onto the device. So we have, it starts off, remember, as a Juice project. So at the top, we've got our Juice, uh, our Juice code here, so our audio engine, uh, the Roly shared code that I mentioned for things like synthesis and sequencing, um, and also our React Native bridge modules that I talked about. Then if we go to the bottom, so we can see that CocoaPods, ha CocoaPods has installed dependencies into this Xcode workspace. And here we've got the React Native source code, which makes up the, Re the native core of React Native that I talked about. Then we have up here, we've got um, resources. So what happens is that our JavaScript that we've written describing the UI, there's a tool provided with React Native which will bundle that into a single JavaScript file called main.js bundle. So this file, you can think of it as containing all our UI and business logic. And this is embedded as a resource within the project. So then when the project starts up, um, we bootstrap React Native and it finds this main.js bundle file and uses that to start up the application. And then finally, we also have our Unity project in here. So this is kind of as it gets exported from Unity, you've got like some C++ classes in, on the iOS case, uh, some libraries which it provides which kind of make it all work, and then some data which is like all our assets. So we actually end up with all this stuff in one project um, and with a little bit of well, quite a lot of kind of prodding. You can actually get it all to compile and play nicely. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to walk through an example flow that happens in the app just to visualize how these components are communicating with each other. So we've kind of got our user, our React Native UI, our Unity game, and our Juice Audio Engine. And what I'm going to do is walk through what happens when a user chooses a song and starts playing it and plays a note. So the users kind of see in this screen here, they select a song to play, they touch something, and React Native is going to go off to the Lumi API, get the metadata about that <coughs> song, and it's going to download the song assets as well, the MP3 and the MIDI. Once that's downloaded, React Native is sending a message to the audio engine saying, load this MIDI and this MP3 from this location on disk where it's temporarily downloaded it. So Juice will go and load in the MP3, load in the MIDI, what we do with a MIDI is we actually take advantage of some Roly shared code we already had, which can take a MIDI file and represent it as a value tree. So Juice has got a value tree representation of this loaded MIDI. We turn it into like notes and stuff, which are easier to work with than just like raw MIDI data. At this point, the value tree synchronizer is automatically syncing back all this note information to JavaScript. So we don't need to do anything, just at some point, Near, in the near future, um, JavaScript world is going to have an up-to-date representation of all the MIDI that we've loaded. So now we can send a message to Unity going, all right, these are the notes, load these in, and it can prepare all the 3D blocks that it wants to render. And now we're ready to go. We've got all the data we need, and the user can press Start. So when the user presses Start, 
Again, you know, touch the UI element. And what's going to happen, first of all, is React Native is going to show the Unity view component. So we kind of bring it to the front. There's actually a couple of React Native UI elements on top of it, for like a metronome and stuff. So you can mix and match these two layers. Um, but conceptually, you can think of Unity as having taken over the view now. And then what we do, I realize that this isn't totally accurate anymore, but we basically tell them both to start at the same time. What actually happens now, which I didn't have time to update the slides, is we tell Unity to start, and then when it's ready, it tells the audio engine to start. But in essence, what happens is we start these two things playing, and we have our visual playback and our audio playback starting <laughs> at the same time, playing at the same speed, and they stay in sync, and the user sees this 3D representation of a song, and hears some music, and starts playing along. Um, now, when the user plays a note, what's going to happen is we're going to send a MIDI message to the audio engine, um, which is in Juice, and that's going to play a note. What's also going to happen is that's going to send an event saying a note was played. Now, we, this is an event rather than a value tree synchronizer thing, because like a note on is more of an instantaneous thing. It's not like a state change, necessarily. So this would be emit event to JS. And that's Ben basically going to forward that message on to Unity, saying you know this note has happened, and the game's going to react to that, and this cycle continues. Um, so as I say, you, you, know, you could actually cut out the middleman there, but we haven't yet found a need to do it. Um, and then at some point in time, you know, they'll reach the end of a game, and Unity will, so Unity will send a message to React Native saying game over, and we'll show the user their score, and so on. So hopefully that like, conceptualizes how these things talk to each other. So I'm just going to finish up some best practices that we learned as we kind of developed the app. So one thing is like if you're going to build a system like this, making sure that each component has clear responsibility and like communication boundaries between them. So if you can avoid, for example, having to communicate all the time between components, that's going to be better, because obviously there's an overhead to this communicating between these different worlds. Um, so like as I showed at the start, our app quite neatly compartmentalizes into these three areas, which actually are quite separate. So if you can design your application in this way where you have clear areas of responsibility for each technology, you're probably going to find it easier. And kind of linked to that, we found it helpful to ensure that each component can be developed and tested in isolation. So particularly on the Unity side, to do a compile with the Unity part in the app isn't all that quick. Whereas if we can develop it in the Unity IDE, this is like instant. You can do hot reloading and stuff. So we ended up creating a component in Unity which can simulate the messages it gets from React Native. So we can then basically simulate most things in the Unity IDE and not have to do this back and forth of compiling all the time. Um, we also have a screen in React Native where you can like trigger audio engine events. So we can test audio en engine stuff without having to go into a game every time. As you might have gathered, the, it's a fairly complex setup. So using build scripts to automate all the steps you need to take uh, is a massive time saver. We use something called Rake, which is a Ruby build system. You could use whatever you want, but it's all about making the setup reproducible so there's no manual steps every time you change something. You just run one command. This is more of a general best practice, but we set up continuous integration, building the app on iOS and Android, and then creating installable builds, um, which QA or a developer can install onto their device without having to do anything manual. Massive time saver. Um, we use Microsoft Azure to build the app and then Microsoft App Center to distribute it. And that handles all the like, signing and so on that you need to do. Um, massive time saver, particularly if you like, put version numbers which describe exactly what that build is. And then finally, on the native side, for those of you who are new to that world and you're interested in it, I highly recommend using TypeScript, which is a typed superset of JavaScript from Microsoft. If you're used to like C++ or whatever, you're going to find it much more enjoyable. I'm sure I don't need to sell you on that. Um, and this MobX library that I mentioned is uh, it's a great way for like, handling the application state. It's not all that widely used in the React world, and it should be more widely used. So I just thought I'd plug that. Um, and finally, just a little bit of reflection on how this worked out for us. So, I mean, we're able to do what we set out to do, which is build a high-quality application in a fairly short time frame. And I think if we hadn't have used this setup of technologies, we couldn't have hit the same level of quality we did, because primarily it allowed members of the team to focus on the areas they specialize in. So we had like JavaScript developers with a web background who could focus on building the UI and making that as beautiful as possible and as good to interact with. Uh, then Unity developers could focus on making the Unity part work as well as possible you know, from a game background. Um, and then the audio engine you know, could be developed in isolation, C++. And once we have this glue to connect them together, you didn't really have to think too much about the fact that you're part of this wider application all the time. Um, 
It's worked surprisingly well cross-platform. I have to say, I was amazed when I first built and ran it on an Android device and it worked. I wasn't fully expecting that. Um, but actually, like React Native works well cross-platform. Unity works well cross-platform. Juice works well cross-platform. Um, Android Audio is still a little bit of a challenge. We had to massively strip down our synth engine to hit as many Android devices as we could. There's just some. It, it's just, just worth being aware of. It's still, you know, it can still be quite challenging to get real-time audio working well on Android. Uh, this investment in all this integration, particularly the Juice React Native stuff that I talked about, kind of gave us a solid foundation for future work we want to do. You know, if we want to expand the app in different directions, we've got a good foundation for that. And it also helped us during the process you know, of prototyping and iteration, but we'd, we'd got this solid way of working. But I, d I probably don't need to tell you, it's a pretty complex stack, and it might not surprise you, but it required quite a lot of work to get this integration working well. Um, so there is a trade-off there, you know. And for example, like if you're debugging something which happens across the three components, it's not all that fun because <laughs> there's no like easy way to drop a breakpoint and step through everything. Um, I end up logging a lot of stuff if I'm honest, but that's fine. Um, and like in summary, we thought this worked. We thought this worked really well for us. Like you know, it helped us build the application in the way we wanted to, but. You, you, you've got to be aware that you are trading one kind of complexity for another with this approach, you know. Um, and if you're looking at this like this for your own project, just have a think about how well it fits. Like, for example, if you're really focused on getting the optimum performance, this might not be the way for you to do it because, you know, you've got essentially three runtimes existing at the same time. Um, but if, you know, you're really concerned about the UI being as nice as possible, maybe you've got JavaScript developers who you want to help out on the UI side, certainly the React Native component works great and, you know, Unity was great for the game stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, really that's, that's kind of it. Um, thank you all for listening. And if you've got any questions, do we have time for some questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, yeah. That's great, thanks. Thanks. Um, so how big was the team that worked on this? Like, can you just give an overview of the team? And how sure, yeah, yeah, it was, um, so two JavaScript developers, um, two Unity developers, uh, one C++ developer, and myself, which was kind of doing a bit of everything and dealing with the bridging and so on. So, I mean, by the standards of like building a cross-platform mobile app, I think it was fairly small. What about the design portion of that? Oh, uh, yeah, design, uh, we've got a team of hmm, three, 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 three UX and UI designers. But, you know, like I say, I've been able to, one of the great advantages of React Native is you can be like, designer, come sit with me, we're going to just tweak these numbers until you're happy, you know, and it, is, it makes the design process a lot more iterative. When can you have one? Yeah, I want to see what keys right up, but there isn't one here anywhere. Yeah, there is. There's one in the corner up in the lunchroom. If you go into the... It's never there whenever I go. Yeah. I'll have a word. <laughs> Hiya. Um, I was just wondering, once you've made the decision to use Unity for the game side, uh, did you consider using something that, like Wise that's already well integrated with it and can handle MIDI and that kind of thing? If I'm honest, we didn't, and that was primarily because actually Unity came into the game, game uh, fairly late. We'd actually done a lot of prototyping in React Native. We'd built out an audio engine, um, which worked well, and we prototyped a lot of these concepts in React Native. So at that point, to redo it all in Unity would have been a huge undertaking, and we didn't have the skills in the team or the time frame to allow that. Um, but I mean, you know, potentially that could be an avenue. But also we wanted to be able to reuse, like we have a lot of roly, you know, got obviously our own synths, and then we've also got our own sequencing code and so on. And we felt that having an audio engine in Juice would give us the most flexibility in future to expand this in whatever directions we might want to take it. If you had a bit more development time, is there part of the stack that you'd consider doing in, um native in, in Swift or Java, something that no. you'd... Oh. No, I wouldn't, to awesome. be honest. I, React Native, I, I really like React Native. I think it's fantastic. Um, no, I, I'm honestly pretty happy with how it worked out. And I, I, just, I, I just think the amount of resource we'd require to do both those platforms. I mean, if you wanted to expand you know, to other platforms in the future, it's just not really scalable for us. And um, yeah, I think React Native does a great job. So I didn't really feel that need at all. <laughs> I think we're out of time. So, okay. Uh, Thank you.